As Darcy mentioned, my most recent book, which is coming out in North America shortly, um, is called Science and Spiritual Practices. And in that book, I discuss seven different spiritual practices that have been investigated scientifically. Um, meditation, gratitude, connecting with the more than human world, nature, relating to plants, singing and chanting, rituals, and uh, pilgrimage. Now, these are all very different, and when I've been thinking about how is it that such different spiritual practices found in all different religious and cultural traditions um, can all have a spiritual effect, um, I had to start thinking about the, the sort of map of the spiritual realm. Um, what's going on? What kinds of spiritual connection do these make, these very different practices? And there are many more spiritual practices, and, and taking psychedelics, sports, uh, which is, I think, one of the most common spiritual practices in the modern world, they're not normally treated as one. Um, uh, prayer, um, uh, there's a whole host of other practices. Um, how do they work? So, I've been thinking about the map of the spiritual terrain, and not trying to make it up, but trying to see what all these different traditions have said about it and what they have in common. The first point, though, is that there are some people who simply say there is no such thing as a spiritual realm. And these are usually materialists. And materialism is still the dominant uh, belief system within institutional science and the academic world in general. And materialism is the belief that the, only, the ultimate reality is matter, or physical reality. Uh, matter is unconscious. The whole universe is unconscious, uh, or non-conscious. Um, and the only kinds of consciousness that exist are inside brains, particularly human brains, and possibly animal brains, or maybe the brains of little green men on other planets. But it's, it's a very cerebrocentric view of consciousness. It's only in brains, and most of all in ours. And the rest of the universe is the stars, the plan planets, the galaxies, uh, the, everything else is unconscious or non-conscious. That is the standard view. Uh, it's a view I discuss in my book, Science Set Free. Uh, I think it's scientifically been superseded by science itself. But nevertheless, it's this default belief system of most educated people. And from that point of view... Spiritual practices can't possibly connect you with realms of spiritual reality beyond the human level because such things don't exist. Um, nevertheless, uh, a new breed of atheist materialists um, is taking up spiritual practices uh, because they're proven to be good for you and they help people. One such person is Sam Harris, one of the leading new atheists who wrote a book called The End of Faith. Sam Harris is now an ardent meditator and gives online meditation courses. His most recent book was called Waking Up Spirituality Without Religion. And um, that now spirituality is being adopted. Many atheists are now meditating and, and doing other spiritual practices. Um, an English writer, philosopher called Alain de Botton, an atheist, recently wrote a book called Religion for Atheists. Um, uh, trying to reinvent religion for atheists because people without it lose out on so many things. They don't gather together and sing, they don't go on pilgrimages, they don't uh, have many of the traditional spiritual practices of religion. And uh, there's now uh, an atheist church in England called the Sunday Assembly where people meet on Sunday mornings, sing hymns or these songs and turn up lifting stories. So from the point of view of materialists are atheists, and most materialists are atheists, um, what are spiritual practices doing? Well, they're activating bits of the brain, they're uh, activating the reward centre in the brain, they're changing levels of dopamine and other chemical transmitters inside the brain, and they're giving you a good feeling. It's all inside the head. And Insofar as God is involved, then their view, of course, the atheist view is that God doesn't exist out there. God is only an idea in human minds and hence in human brains. And uh, is a kind of projection. Freud thought it was a kind of father figure projection. Um, 
a modern breed of evolutionary psychology, ACS say that God's a result of an uh, agency detection system that we've inherited. Uh, uh, our ancestors in the jungle, if they heard a rustling noise, would attribute it to some living agent, a saber-toothed tiger or something, um, and therefore became hyper-vigilant for agency and therefore tend to see spirits and gods and agencies in all nature, when in fact it's nothing but inanimate matter working mechanically uh, and completely and non-consciously. Well, that is basically the atheist view. So there's not much more to say about how God works, since it's really all about how our minds work. If we then look to people who don't have that particular belief system, which is the vast majority of humanity for the vast majority of human history, um, we find that all these cultures, all religions, all shamanic cultures, believe that there are forms of consciousness beyond the human level, um, and there are many kinds of them. There's a whole taxonomy. There are spirits, animal spirits, nature spirits, plant spirits. There are ancestors. Ancestors can interact with the living, and this is taken for granted in most cultures. There are angels, um, beings that um, permeate the whole universe in the stars on Earth, um, spiritual beings that are active and affect what happens here. Um, there are gods and goddesses, uh, each with their own particular realm of influence. For example, the sun god in India, Surya, Apollo, the sun god in Greece, um, in Japan, the sun's a goddess. In Northern Europe, the sun is a goddess. The gender can switch. But the idea is that as a living being in the sun and in all the stars. So there's a whole realm of beings that are conscious but not inside brains. Um, and then, uh, beyond all that, uh, the, in, in many uh, religions, there's the idea that there's a supreme consciousness, a consciousness that includes all these others, uh, a unified consciousness underlying all nature and all minds. So, what I'm going to do is look at these maps of um, a consciousness, uh, the ultimate consciousness in the universe, uh, as different traditions have put it forward. And when, it, when you look at this, it turns out there's an extraordinary degree of agreement. Uh, the, the differences between religions are much smaller than the areas in which they agree. And one of the most brilliant books in modern philosophical theology is a book called The Experience of God Being Consciousness Bliss by David Bentley Hart, an American theologian. And uh, he shows very clearly uh, how these maps agree in most important respects. The first thing is to recognize that the reason people think there's a consciousness beyond the human level is not, for most people, based on logical reasoning or even um, on um, other people's revelation. It's based on their own direct experiences. And the point of uh, spiritual practices is that they give you direct experiences. If you meditate, then you have experiences about the nature of your mind and how it works and what lies um, underneath the normal mental uh, activity that we experience. Um, if you take psychedelics of a visionary kind, you have altered states of consciousness that show you there's more to consciousness than our normal waking state. Um, if you take part in rituals... Uh, that are particularly powerful and effective. You have a sense of connection that goes beyond your ordinary, everyday life. Um, and many people have spontaneous mystical experiences that don't come as a result of any practice at all. They're experiences of going beyond and connecting with another kind of spiritual reality. One of the more common kinds in the modern world are near-death experiences. More people have these now than ever before, owing to the effectiveness of modern medicine. Um, lots of people who would have died in the past now only nearly die, and so they have near-death experiences. And many people who have these experiences feel themselves floating out of their body, going through a kind of tunnel, and emerging into a light of peace, joy, and love that's far greater than their normal consciousness, that they uh, feel is uh, more real somehow than this world, 
And most people in Hathis feel that their whole life has been completely changed. It alters their attitude on life. Many say they've lost the fear of death. And many of them uh, become uh, much more helpful to other people as a result of it. So these kinds of experiences through the ages are what have made people think there are forms of consciousness beyond our own. Not logical deduction, but direct experience of them. And the number of people who have spontaneous mystical experiences is enormous. Uh, recent surveys have shown that a majority of the population in Britain and North America have had these experiences at one time or another. Um, so here we have these experiences of connection with the greater realm of being. Some people, like Tibetan monks, uh, spend hours a day in meditation exploring these other realms of consciousness. And they also explore the consciousness during their sleep as well, through dream yoga and through other practices. And I would say they're the ultimate experts on this in the sense that they've done it more than most. And most people who've done it more than most uh, talk about a state of consciousness that they can reach which is non-dual, where they feel they're fusing with this ultimate source of all consciousness. Um, in, to, in Buddhism, it's called nirvana, extinction of the normal self. It, it's negatively defined as, as, as extinction. Um, and some people describe the ultimate state of Buddhism, the ultimate aim of Buddhism, as a kind of permanent ontological suicide. You cease, cease to exist as a separate being, like a drop entering the ocean. You become part of this ultimate conscious state. Other forms of mysticism uh, in, in result in a kind of a sense of loving relationship or presence with the divine, but not complete extinction or fusion with it. But most of the great mystical traditions have said that there's a state of experience which lies beyond all differentiation, beyond all description. The Buddhist uh, the word is nirvana. In the Hindu tradition, it's called nirguna brahman. Nirguna brahman is God without qualities. Um, beyond all description and qualification. Uh, in the Christian tradition, Meister Eckhart called it the, the medieval mystic, Meister Eckhart called it the Godhead. So this, these, they all speak of a state of being or consciousness beyond all description, uh, ineffable, defined only negatively. And in the Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox churches, the mainstream uh, theology there is called apophatic theology, negative theology, but which defines God by not what by God wait, what it, not saying what God is, but by saying what God is not, because you can't really say what God is. You can only say God what God isn't, because by definition, God is beyond our conception. However. This idea of an ultimate unity beyond all description and qualities leaves the problem of how that relates to the world we live in. There's an enormous gulf between a state beyond all description and beyond all qualification and nature and us. So how do you get from one to the other? And this is where the models in different traditions show such striking similarities. Um, in the Hindu version, um, they have a trinity of principles. There's the ultimate ground of being, uh, sometimes called sat, means being, conscious being. Then there's chit, which is mind or consciousness or knowledge, forms, names and forms. And then there's ananda, which is joy or bliss. And sat chit ananda is the, one of the descriptions in the Hindu tradition of this ultimate conscious being. It has three aspects. Other Hindu formulations of this trinity, um, again, have three aspects. They emphasize them slightly differently. In the more common one of the three main gods of Hinduism, Brahman is the creator. Um, the, then uh, Vishnu is the preserver and Shiva is the creator and the destroyer. So Vishnu, the, the, the ground of all things like Sat, uh, Brahma the, the, is right behind all things, the ground of all things. Vishnu preserves forms, shapes, and structures, and is the preserver, and Shiva is the creator and the destroyer. The energy principle, shown as Nataraja dancing Shiva. Um, 
I met one of the Holy Hop maintenance crew the other day as he was going about his work with a cart full of um, maintenance tools. And I said, hello, and we know each other, and we chatted a bit. And I said, what are you up to? He said, just doing the work of Vishnu. Um, <laughs> he said, this is my devotional practice. Um, um, in Kashmiri Shaivism, uh, this trinity has two way, ways of describing it. The ultimate ground of all being is called Parashiva. And then the principle of form and order, in this case, becomes Shiva. And the energy principle that makes everything change is Shakti. And in Indian languages, Shakti is feminine. Uh, the energy principle is feminine. Um, another version in Kashmiri Shaivism talks of the, the ultimate ground of being is the knower, and then the known, chit, the chit aspect is the known, and uh, the spirit or um, uh, shakti aspect is the means of knowledge, the knower, the known, and the means of knowledge. We have many different kinds of trinity. There are goddess trinities, goddess trinities in which uh, the maiden, the, the mother, and the old woman are, are the three aspects, and there's the fertile mother who gives life, but there's also the destroying aspect of the goddess who takes it away. In India, Kali, the black goddess, shown with dripping fang, fangs dripping with blood, it is literally red in tooth and claw. Um, so that's another area of triple, of, triple, uh, of trinities. In Taoism, starting from completely different principles, uh, it also leads to a trinity. Um, one of the key Taoist sayings in Chinese philosophy is, from the one come the two, yin and yang, the, the polar principles that, that underlie all nature and all things. From the two come the three. And I think my interpretation of that is, you've got the Tao, the circle, in the, in the yin-yang symbol, the circle around everything is the one, the yin and the yang within it, interacting, are the, are the two. And the two, the one that encloses them is the three. Um, and from the three come the 10,000 things. This is a generative trinity that generates everything in nature. So that comes from a completely different starting point, philosophical part starting point, that comes to a similar model. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, we have a view of God as the ground of all being. The first statement by God in the, in the Bible, where Moses encounters God in the Virgin Bush and says, what is your name? God says, I am that I am. I am is subjective conscious being, and it's, it's a statement of conscious being. The prime thing uh, uh, about God is conscious being. It's the primary qualification. And that's true of all these models of God. Conscious being is their key feature, uh, but then differentiated into different functions that express themselves in the world. In the Jewish, and uh, implicitly in the Jewish, and explicitly in the Christian tradition, the two modes through which God, the ground of being, expresses himself or herself is through the principle of form and the principle of energy, or Spirit, which means breath, wind, fire, flame, light, all the images of spirit and movement, images of movement or change. In the very first verse of Genesis, we read, The earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the deep. Basically, the wind blowing over the water, and what does that create? Creates waves or vibrations. So there's a dynamical principle. And then, within a verse or two, God starts creating by dividing the one into two and the, by dividing the whole into parts, a bit like the tower coming forth by the division separating light from <coughs> darkness day from night um, dry land from uh, water and so on, the heavens from the earth, so it's a process of division but this is brought about by speaking and God said in the New Testament and in Christian theology the, these two principles are developed much more explicitly so that the principal act modes of action of God in the world are through spirit, energy, movement, change, wind, breath, and word, logos. Um, and in the New Testament, written in Greek, 
they had to assimilate Greek philosophy to this essentially Semitic religion. And the main feature of Greek philosophy uh, that, that was still one of its main features is Plato's idea of a world of forms or ideas, but behind reality is a kind of cosmic mind containing all forms, ideas, and possibilities, names and forms. And so this became the Logos, uh, the second person of the Trinity, the mind of God, that which produces forms, orders, structures, patterns, and the spirit is the breath. The principal metaphor here, um, which is what makes it easier to remember and understand, is precisely speaking. Um, When I speak, when you speak, um, there's a speaker, that's the ground of what's happening, a unified source. But the speech itself has two distinguishable aspects. Um, One of them is, of course, the flow of breath. I can only speak when my breath's flowing out. If it's not flowing, if I'm not breathing out, I can be thinking words in my mind, but they're not expressed into the world because they're not taking on a physical form. If I only breathe out, there's a flow of energy, but there are no words. It's only with the words and forms, each word has a structure of form, a structure of consonants and vowels and vibratory patterns. Um, And these words refer very often to aspects of the world, and they're connected with meanings. And So we get into the whole world of chit, consciousness, form, word. But it has to have that flow of energy to do anything. So basically this is the model of what the Christians call the Holy Trinity, And the creeds of Christianity, the the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, often dismissed by people with a wave of the hand as mere dogma, are actually statements of the belief that God has three aspects. They're very, very far from the popular misunderstanding that God must be some old man with a white beard uh, who's some particularly unpleasant tyrant. Um, uh, There are these views of God which bear no relation whatsoever to the um, understanding that, uh, that is the official understanding codified in the Christian creeds, which are essentially that God has three, is one that has three aspects, not three gods, one God with three modes or aspects, the ground of being, the form or word, and the spirit. <clears throat> um, Many Christian theologians have discussed the Holy Trinity. It's one of the central doctrines of Christianity. St. Augustine, in his psychological model of the Holy Trinity, uh, thought of God the Father as the knower, God the Son as the known, and God the Holy Spirit as the joy of of, of the love between them. Again, very similar to the Kashmir and Shaiva thing, and quite independent of it. This brings up a point Jill mentioned that um, the, we, we run into big problems with gender when talking about God. And gendered language has never been a hotter topic than it is today. Um, <laughs> clearly, the source of all being has to be, and all theologians agree, has to be beyond all differentiations of gender, male and female. It's a source of all polarities in nature, of all genders, all which is a polarity a sexual polarity in animals and plants. Uh, the source of all polarities, the unity behind them all, cannot possibly be masculine or feminine in any normal sense of the word. But the use of gendered metaphors, he or possibly she, um, misleading though it is, is better than saying it, because it implies it's an inanimate, unconscious object, which is certainly not the nature of the divine according to anyone's ideas. Um, so the, um, uh, the gender, uh, the adoption of they actually seems to be quite appropriate for the Holy Trinity, um, o- overcoming the gender problems. Um, and of course, religions and theologies and spiritualities are constantly evolving. Um, although they're rooted in the past, they're always developing. I think we're on the threshold of a major new phase of spiritual and religious evolution at the moment. And I think that the, the, the gender debate that's going on at the moment is actually quite helpful in uh, rethinking some of the gender terms used of God. <coughs> the 
this idea of a trinity of conscious being with a ground of conscious being, a formative principle, the word logos, logos, names and forms, nama rupa, and a spirit or dynamical principle um, present in all these traditions um, is thought to be uh, reflected in nature. The Hindu tradition is, is one of the most explicit about this. They regard the ultimate consciousness, Satchitananda, as the basis of all being, the entire universe, and every mind within it, every consciousness within it, including our own. Our own minds are like fractals of the ultimate mind, which is why we can learn about ultimate reality through observing uh, our own minds uh, through going within, uh, because they share in the same nature. That's why in meditation, uh, if one can reach the ground of consciousness, seeing thoughts flowing past, um, and letting them go in a meditative practice without getting attached to them, uh, being an observer or a witness of these flowing thoughts, one's in a ground of being of consciousness, which um, is not the same as being engaged within the thoughts themselves. It's like the container of the thoughts. And the Hindu, uh, the basic Hindu insight in the Upanishads is that our conscious mind is the ultimate conscious mind. Um, it's an aspect of it. It relates directly to it. It's part of it. And uh, therefore, our minds are not separate from the ultimate mind. They seem separate. A common Hindu metaphor is that if you have buckets full of water, each of them reflecting the moon, it looks as if there's hundreds of separate moons, but they're all reflections of the one moon uh, in different containers. And so our minds are reflections of this ultimate mind. So this is a basic assumption in Hinduism that all minds, not just human minds, the minds of gods, the minds of plants, the minds of animals, the minds of planets and stars, um, would have the same structure. In the Christian tradition, uh, the idea in the Middle Ages was that the whole of nature reflected this being of God. The, Fran the Franciscan uh, philosopher Bonaventure, who followed St. Francis in the Middle Ages, proposed that everything in nature reflects the Holy Trinity, the consciousness of God, the formative principle of God, and the uh, energy of the Spirit. And the present Pope, Pope Francis, in his wonderful encyclical on the environment, La Date Si, quotes St. Bonaventure and endorses this view of all creation as a reflection of the consciousness and dyna dy dynamic activity of the Holy Trinity. There's a somewhat different approach in Islam, because Islam um, has a, an emphasis on the uniqueness and, 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 and unity of God. But to get from God to the rest of the world, they have to have some bridging principle. They don't have the Holy Trinity. Um, they go further than that. They have the 99 names. Um, and the 99 names of God are the aspects or attributes of God, the channels through which God works into the world. And these attributes include, um, they include the, the benevolent, the merciful, but they also include pairs of opposites, the creator, the destroyer, the uplifter, the abaser. Um, so they, they um, see God as reflected in 99 fundamentally distinct ways in creation. Um, I think the Trinity is a more economical and basic way of formulating it. There's, in a sense, is a more elaborated system of channels through of divine uh, working in nature. <coughs> If we think of the Holy Trinity as reflected in, in the natural world, then um, we'd expect to find in all aspects of nature a formative principle, an energetic principle, and a uniting principle, one that makes them a single unit. And this is, of course, what we find in all organisms, in all organized systems, in a plant or an animal. There's something that makes it a unity, makes it distinctly itself and not something else. It has a boundary, a sense of unity. And that unity includes, on the one hand, a formative principle, 
um, which gives it its form or shape or structure, which I myself explain in terms of morphogenetic fields. This is my own hypothesis of the formative principle. Um, and it has an energetic principle, the energy that flows through it. Energy flows through all of the organisms. Sunlight flows into plants and is transformed into their structures and then uh, is released when they're eaten or when they're burned or when they decay. Uh, but there's a constant flow of energy through plants. There's a constant flow of energy through us, through the food we take in and digest. Um, and we all need this flow of energy. But the same energy can give rise to different forms. The same sunlight can give rise to a red cedar, a Douglas fir, a hollyhock, a rose. The same photons of sunlight, uh, they're promiscuous, they can take on any form. And the food that we get here at Hollyhock this evening as we helped ourselves to the delicious food, um, I might have, if, if the queue had worked slightly differently, you might have eaten what I ate and I might have eaten what you ate. <laughs> and, and this energy would have taken on different forms. In, uh, our, our bodies have a different form, our minds create different thoughts and forms of thought, um, taking on different forms. But there's this distinguishable difference between um, form and energy. And at the most fundamental level in physics, uh, what physics tells us in, in, in modern physics is that all reality is basically made up of fields and energy. A quantum particle, like an electron, is a vibration of energy in, a quant in an electron field. Field gives it its structure and identity. The vibration gives it its reality, actuality, and ability to act on other things. Um, um, the... The gravitational field of the sun gives it its form, its spherical form. The energy in it partly streams out of sunlight. Um, everything in nature has this uh, combination of fields and energy, which uh, reflect this, these ultimate principles of spirit and logos. Most of us have grown up with a very distorted view of God and God's nature, which came about really through the enormous revolution in worldview that happened in the 17th century. In the mid Middle Ages in Europe, the general view was that nature was alive, animals and plants were truly living beings with souls. Um, the very word animal comes from the Latin word anima, meaning soul. Animals and plants had souls, humans had souls, all living beings had souls, the earth was a living being, Mother Earth. The stars and the sun and the planets were all living beings with their own minds or guiding intelligences or angelic uh, intelligences. Each star had its own angelic intelligence. Um, we still call the planets by the names of gods and goddesses, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and so on. The heavens were alive. When someone in the Middle Ages looked up at the sky, the sky was full of the presence of God. Every star and every heavenly body was a living being with a mind or an intelligence. Um, and so were all the, all the animals and plants on earth, and so was the earth itself. That was the uh, philosophy in the, in the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, which dominated the Middle Ages and medieval universities. Uh, there was essentially a form of Christian animism. Um, that was the worldview that gave rise to the great Gothic cathedrals, these astonishing uh, structures that synthesize uh, spiritual vision, state-of-the-art engineering, stained glass, kind of psychedelic uh, light effects, and so on, uh, were all part of a unified vision of a living God and a living world. This view of the world was shattered first through the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, uh, which denied the idea that nature was uh, a vehicle of divine grace. At best, it was a kind of neutral backdrop for a drama of salvation played out between humans and God. And then, taken much further in the 17th century revolution in science, uh, when the view was that nature is some vast machine, the universe is like a great clockwork mechanism, animals and plants are machines, um, uh, they're mechanistic. Um, that's why uh, that's still the official ideology of biology. That's why we have factory farms, genetic engineering, biotechnology. All these machine metaphors uh, uh, come from the idea that, that all animals and plants, all nature is mechanical. It's called 
the mechanistic philosophy or the mechanical philosophy, which became the dominant paradigm of science by about 1620. Um, and our bodies are machines too. In its original version, mechanistic science, um, as most clearly put forward by René Descartes, the philosopher, created a cosmic dualism. The whole universe, all matter, all animals, all plants, and all human bodies were inanimate, unconscious mechanisms made of unconscious matter. But there was also a spiritual world which was outside space and time, immaterial, uh, which consists of God, angels, and human reason. Uh, human reason was the only thing in the natural world which had the spiritual property. But therefore, humans were totally different from animals and could exploit them at will, uh, totally different from the rest of nature and could exploit it at will, and um, uh, were the only things which could have a connection with this ultimate divine mind. And as science grew on, went on, people came to think of this mind as being essentially mathematical and engineering in nature, um, that God became a kind of external mathematician and engineer who designed the universe, the machine of the universe in the first place, started it in motion at the creation, and then left it to run automatically thereafter. Well, that's the worldview we've all inherited. It's still the official orthodoxy of science. There was a modification in this in the 19th century when increasing numbers of people said, we don't want this dualistic view of God, angels, and human minds uh, uh, being in some other category from the rest of nature, which is just matter. Um, this whole realm of spirit is not measurable, that you can't weigh it, you can't detect it, it simply doesn't exist. And that's how a lot of the philosophy of materialism arose through the denial of the spiritual pole of dualism, leaving only matter. So at one stroke, God and angels vanished from the world picture, and um, human minds became nothing but the activity of brains. This continues to haunt us, because if human minds are nothing but the activity of brains, then, um, and brains are nothing but unconscious matter, we ought not to be conscious. But we are. And this is a terrible problem for, for contemporary materialist philosophers. Uh, they spend a lot of time trying to prove we're not conscious, it's just an illusion. But uh, even if it's an illusion, um, illusion itself is a mode of consciousness. So this is called the hard problem. The very existence of human consciousness is the hard problem, and it's insoluble within the framework of materialist or mechanistic science. However much you look at the brain and scan brains, you don't understand the nature of consciousness. So, um, in this worldview of a mechanical universe that works automatically, there's nothing much for God to do except design it in the first place. And then, perhaps, for those of faith, to intervene in the workings of the machinery, suspending the laws of nature very occasionally to bring about a miracle mm -hmm. which has to be taken on faith. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the kind of worldview, automatic nature, transcendent and uh, not uh, gone totally beyond it all, um, uh, who is at best a kind of optional extra for the world machine. That's the kind of uh, belief system which most atheists reject. I'm not an atheist, I reject it too. Um, the God that a lot of atheists don't believe in is that kind of God, together with a whole lot of undesirable characteristics about being a tyrant and provoking religious violence. Um, but that is not the God of traditional theology. It's a kind of post-17th century mechanistic theology uh, which gives us this extremely distorted view of the divine. And I think that the much more plausible view is that um, something called panentheism, that God is in nature and nature is in God. That nature is not just the same as God uh, because it would mean then the whole universe was simply the universe, and that's enough. I mean, the universe is vast and incredibly complex. Um, but the idea would be that the universe is like the body of God, and the mind of God transcends it, just like our minds transcend our bodies and our immediate sensory input. In our minds, we can imagine all sorts of things which haven't yet happened and may not happen, but transcend the senses and the measurable facts of our bodily life. And the same would be the idea that there's an aspect of God which transcends the universe. 
a mind that contains all possibilities, including the possibility of other universes. And multiverses are now very popular within science. Um, and so if there were a transcendent God, there would be a mind that transcends all possible universes. Personally, I don't think we need to suppose there are any other universes, just one's enough. Um, <laughs> Um, but if there are lots of other ones, then uh, a transcendent God would have a, a, a mind that could include them all. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a, really a, a view of the panentheism, the idea if we see God in nature and nature in God, we, we have a, a way in which we can understand the spiritual uh, presence all sorts of spiritual influences within nature and transcending it. And what I want to do now is just discuss briefly how this view might help in understanding um, some of the spiritual practices. I think that meditation as a spiritual practice which um, encourages, encourages us not to pay attention to the flood of ideas going through our minds. We let them pass through the mind uh, we let them go through and, and we try not to get attached to them. Um, brings us to the basis of the mind itself, the, c- the container quality of the mind, consciousness of that which contains things, includes and contains, but which is not the same as what's going through it. I think this experience through meditation really brings us in contact with sat or the ground of being. It's, it's that aspect of the trinity that it's connecting us with. Um, When we're chanting or singing, uh, we have something like speech itself, which is a combination of breath and form. Um, It's it's like logos and spirit together. Singing and chanting is actually has more form than just speaking, because there's more structure to the sounds and the pitches and the music. Um, So I think we that that immerses us in the kind of productive realm of logos and spirit. I think when people have spiritual experiences through sports, uh, which many do, um, that's more to do with spirit, and sports are more to do with movement. When people have spiritual experiences or a sense of incredible presence, skiing downhill very fast, or driving a motorbike very fast, or skydiving and plummeting out of the sky very fast, um, uh, I think these are things that are appropriate, uh, approximate to the, where the, the emphasis on the moving principle, the spirit, is greatest. Um, and the reason I think they're spiritual experiences is that they bring people into a, a sense of great presence, of presence with that movement and change. Um, a lot of spiritual practices are about cultivating presence, uh, about our minds not wandering off the default mode network, that chattering mind that is worrying about things, is anxious about things that most of our minds are occupied by much of the time. Um, And sports are a way that we can get out of that. I was discussing this here at Hollycock a couple of years ago with Gifford Pinchot, who who, from Channel Rock, and he um, said, well, he's a rock climber. He said, well, at the busiest time of his life, um, he mind was going all the time. He couldn't sleep very well. He woke up with his mind racing. He tried meditation. It didn't work. So by the time he was 50 feet up a rock face, he was totally in the present. <laughs> um, so, and, and many people have that experience through sports, that they become totally in the present. And if you're playing a soccer match, and it's, you know, someone's passing the ball, you have to be aware where everybody is on the field and what the opportunities are, what the other people are doing. If you just start worrying about have you paid this bill or uh, what you should have said to your girlfriend after a row you just had or something like that, it, you lose the plot. You've got to be totally present. And so I think in the modern world, sports are one of the ways in which people come, become most totally present, but most totally present within movement, within change. And so all aspects of this trinity are always present, but some emphasize one aspect more than another. Some spiritual experiences come about through the experience of beauty. And for me, uh, one of the primary experiences of beauty comes about through plants, looking at flowers. Um, And looking at flowers or looking at works of art or looking at things that are beautiful 
I think is principally activating the logos aspect, the, the formative aspect, that the flowers are pretty static. It's not all about change, movement, it's being present with, present with that beauty. Uh, the word or logos aspect of the divine. Um, and I think that reason, the reason why psychedelics can have a spiritual impact, they don't always, but I think they can do, especially if taken within um, ceremonial forms, as in ayahuasca ceremonies, um, is that they uh, put us in that realm of, again, logos and spirit, the creative imagination, the, the immense potential of minds. According to St. Anselm, the medieval theologian, God's mind is the container of all possibilities. And so if God's mind contains all possibilities, uh, normally our minds contain a very limited subset of those, uh, but with psychedelics, um, the range of possibilities is greatly expanded and it can be exhilarating to explore them. Some psychedelics, particularly uh, DMT, uh, can lead beyond the realm of, of, of form uh, into the state of unity with the ground of being. At least they do for some people. Um, so, um, so one can interpret these different kinds of spiritual experience on this map. Now, for somebody who believes this is all just a projection, it's all inside the brain, um, these might seem useless maps or at best, um, you know, fanciful ways of constructing experience. But we have to remember that for anyone who thinks there is no consciousness out there, which is what all religions believe, um, the idea that there can't be anything out there, it's all in the mind, is a belief system. It's a, a, a belief system brought about historically through mechanistic science, then through the denial of dualism and the ascendancy of materialism as a philosophy or worldview. And it's a belief system that leaves us with a view of the universe as essentially pointless, purposeless, unconscious, not going anywhere, our minds inside our brains essentially separate and isolated from each other, and the uh, evolution is essentially purposeless, everything essentially purposeless. It's a depressing worldview, and it's not surprising that in society is dominated by it, like our own uh, depression is one of the most endemic mental problems. So it's a belief system, and it's not a very helpful one. There have now been many studies that show that people who have religious or spiritual belief systems are happier, healthier, and live longer. Uh, they feel more connected, uh, more related to other people, and also to the world beyond the human level the more-than-human world, as David Abram uh, puts it. Um, so I think that when we, when we think about this more-than-human world, um, then these maps are actually quite helpful. A lot of people are against God because their image of God is, as I said, a sort of patriarchal tyrant, a, 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 an old man who's totally unpleasant. Um, the, that's uh, an image of God which they've got locked into and want to reject. But um, sometimes that leads to people saying they completely reject the idea of a male God transcending nature. Instead, uh, they want nature itself to be the source of all spirituality and spiritual being. In other words, they reject Father God in favour of Mother Nature. <laughs> um, the trouble is, I think that this... Um, this swing from one pole to the other is, is also a, a, a kind of going too far, too much, too extreme, because first, all these genders, in any case, are arbitrary. Um, and if we think about um, what's really going on, the idea that it's Mother Nature is the source of everything, everything comes from the Mother, everything goes back to the Mother, the Mother is the source of all things, which is the underlying mythology of materialism. Uh, we can see, I think, that materialism is essentially an unconscious great mother cult. Um, and um, it's a, a, a belief in the total supremacy of the mother principle. Um, and it works itself out in detail. In neo-Darwinism, for example, um, Darwin, well, Darwin himself um, thought of nature evolution as being driven primarily by the destructive power of nature. As Tennyson put it, nature read in tooth and claw. Um, 
works pretty well a description of Kali. And uh, so I think the dark, destructive aspect of the goddess is what most impressed Darwin, but it was kind of unconscious. He always personified nature, he wrote it with a capital N, and at one stage in The Origin of Species, he said, I realise I am personifying nature. He said, uh, this is simply a term of phrase, and I advise my readers to forget any other implications that <laughs> might come to their minds. It's a, he's using it as a personification, then trying to deny it. But actually, I think it was an essential part of the way he thought. And in neo-Darwinism, people who are obsessed with DNA and genes, um, uh, the... Um, no, the, the um, chap Mono, who wrote the key book on this years ago, called Chance and Necessity, uh, the idea that you've got the, the, the genes that you get at birth determine what can happen, and then there's the, um, the, the, the chance mutations and the necessity of natural selection. It, the key thing, whenever you're hearing some ardent materialist or near darwinist speaking, is just say, where are the hidden goddesses? And Who's the hidden goddess of chance? Well, you don't have to look very far. The Roman goddess Fortuna was blind, but always portrayed with a blindfold. The wheel of fortune cast things, took rose, fortunes rose up and they fell down through the revolutions of the wheel of fortune. Um, so chance. And then necessity um, in Mono, uh, in the Greek mythology, is represented by the three fates the stern spinning sisters who cut a lot, uh, who, who spin, cut, and a lot the thread of life, dispensing to mortals their destiny at birth. Do you think, is there anything in modern neo darwinism that has a thread of life that dispenses to mortals their destiny at birth? Well, yes, it's called DNA. <laughs> um, um, so, there, there, I think that... Um, Although people who've tried to demythologize their view of the world get rid of all these images, I think they've been reinvented in a hidden form, but one which is enormously powerful at an, at an unconscious level, which is why people who have this belief system often get incredibly emotional and upset if it's challenged in any way, as I've found uh, to my own cost on many occasions. <laughs> um, Well, I think that it lays out the sort of basic model. I mean, one could go further. I mean, how does God know what's happening in the world? How does he affect the events that happen in the world? These, uh, I think, we'll have to wait for another uh, occasion. Um, but uh, I think these are, uh, one can actually think about these things in a way that, at least to me, makes sense um, and relate uh, some of these very traditional teachings found in all the great wisdom traditions of the world to each other and to the world we're living in and to make sense of our own experiences. And I think they give a much more coherent picture uh, than any of the alternatives or especially the materialist, uh, atheist alternative um, which is the one most commonly presented to students in universities and the one which dominates our official culture. So... Um, there you are. It's just a, a summary of the way things might, the way things might be. So, I'd be very happy to hear any comments or questions. Yes. You mentioned purpose, but you didn't speak to purpose. That uh, uh, that in the in the uh, the threefold workings of of God, there's there's the there's the outflowing of the singularity. Um, where does the purpose come into that? Well, I think that the, the purpose is, is uh, understood by Aristotle and Greek philosophers, Aquinas and theologians, as working in accordance with attraction. And I think that when we think about purposes, there are goals in the future, or potential goals in the future, which work by attraction. And uh, that's true also of um, much more mundane situations and if you've got a hungry dog and there's a bone um, it's attracted towards the bone it has the purpose of satisfying its hunger and it even has a measurable force if you put a spring balance in its leash as the dog strains at the leash you can actually measure a force directed in a particular direction <laughs> which is a teleological or purposive force goal directed um, 
So I think that one of the interesting things about this theology of the Holy Spirit, which is relevant to this, is that um, some models of the Holy Spirit treat it as joy, ananda, or bliss, as in Sat ananda. Others treat it as a principle of movement. And so why do they have these two very seemingly very different aspects? And it's very relevant to this question, because the, the point of all these theological systems is that the the being of God is complete, not wanting anything. Um, it's complete. It's in a state of perpetual bliss or joy. Um, and out of this state of extreme fullness of bliss and joy comes an overflowing of the spirit. The world is created through an overflowing or emanation out of a fullness, not out of a sense of need, lack, or want. Now, most of our purposes come from a need, lack, or want. You're hungry, you want food. You're thirsty, you want to drink. You, you know, you, you're in a state of great desire, you want sex. You know, the, you, you're, you're greedy, you want to make more money, and you, you try and do that, devote a lot of time to it. Um, so the, the, these all come from lack or need. So the idea is that in the divine being, the number comes from lack or need. But the overflowing... Uh, once the spirit has flowed out into the world and the creation, then where's it going to go? It's only got one place to go, which is back to where it came from as a kind of circuit. And so it's attracted back towards unity, and so this is spirit which flows back towards the ultimate state of being. When Aristotle described God as the prime mover of the universe, he didn't mean that God pushed the universe from behind, he meant that God attracted the universe from the future as the ultimate state of perfection. Everything is moving towards a state of perfection or completion, um, which means it's attracted towards these ultimate goals. And all other goals are, are sort of much more partial, more limited goals. So purpose and joy and spirit are all related in that way. At least that's the traditional theory. Mantras. Well, I think um, mantras are where you use a, a particular phrase repeatedly in meditation or in, in, in chanting. Um, and mantras are transmitted from a lineage of teachers. In Tibet, as Jill often points out, um, people traditionally spent a lot of their time traveling around Tibet to get transmissions of mantras from teachers, because it had to be an oral transmission from someone who uses that mantra. And I think, to, to, to my own view of them, depends partly on my ideas on morphic resonance, the idea that particular patterns or forms link up across time by a kind of resonance or memory. So if you chant the mantra uh, over and over again, you resonate with yourself chanting it in the past, you also resonate with all the other people who've chanted it in the past. And if it's been something associated with states of enlightenment or uh, mystic union or um, higher states of consciousness, then that will help tap you into what are sometimes called the attainments of the masters, those who've done it before. Um, and that's also the reason why most religions have strong pro uh, um, prohibitions against blasphemy, if you use sacred words in inappropriate contexts, then when you use them again, when people use them, it will weaken their force because you'll resonate with secular or profane or inappropriate contexts. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's in, that's why many traditions keep mantras secret, and you're not supposed to go around talking about your mantra. So, um, <coughs> so that's how, at least how I see them. Um, and of course, there are many different mantras, and all traditions have their own. I'm interested in, in, in if you could explain somehow a connection zone for yourself personally. In the respect, I, I kind of get, I played professional sports for many years, and get the zone, you call it the zone you're in. I get that. But it's never an obtainable, constant thing. It is a thing that's there and gone. In yes. the theologies, Christ mm. proclaimed 
to be the connection. In other theologies, there's a connection with nature, there's a connection with whatever. But what would you say is is something that you could say would be a continuous connection? Because purpose to me is a connection. We, through the beginning of time, have had this wonderment of a us to God, a connection. And that's what's missing. And I think that's what we've always been searching for as a species is some connection. So I would like to know what you feel is a personal connection that you can say is that. Well, I think that the, the, the thing of being in the zone, I mean, it doesn't last long. Um, many spiritual experiences don't last long. Near-death experiences can often change people's lives, but they only last you know, a minute, two minutes. Um, some people have a flash on a DMT trip that may only last one or two minutes and it changes their perspective. Um, so most spiritual experiences of, of this state of connection are fairly short-lived. Um, nevertheless, that doesn't alter the fact they're important. And I myself think that the, there are all these different ways of connecting uh, with the spirit of which sports is one. Um, and if it's short lived, that doesn't not particular sports. It's, it's just true of most spiritual experiences. There's very few that last all the time. I mean, there are some particularly holy people who seem to be in a beatific state for long periods of time. But for many people, it's fairly brief, and then it affects the way they see their life and the way they lead their life. But it doesn't have to be there all the time. I myself see these connections as I've just been saying, through many different ways of relating to that which is beyond ourselves, the spiritual realm beyond ourselves. And so if there's a sense of being present in the spirit, the presence of movement or in a sport, in the zone, where you're in that state of flow, and spirit's all about flow, um, you're in that state of flow, uh, you're in a state of flow that's about more than yourself, really. It's a a transpersonal state of flow. um, And... uh, particularly if it's in a game, a team game, where you're playing with other people, it's, it, it can sometimes be a collective state of flow. And what that tells us, I think, is that there are states of flow we can be in, that there are flows in the universe and in nature and in human life that take us beyond ourselves, and that's the nature of the way things are. And the more we connect with these, the more we have a sense of greater connection, a greater satisfaction in the way we lead our lives. But I don't think any one of them would necessarily be enough. And that's why all religions and most spiritual practitioners have a range of practices. You know, if you go to regular, observe regular religious practice, and I myself am an Anglican, a Christian. So um, when I, singing hymns is singing with a group in a community, it brings communities together. <laughs> Having sacred times, like Sundays and festivals, is a way of creating a space where a community of people can open to these other realms um, through making love, through being in nature, through having time not to work, through delight and joy. And the Jewish uh, Sabbath is, is the Jews are the people who observe this most clearly and most explicitly. Um, it's always been a central feature of the Jewish faith, um, one of the Ten Commandments. So there's other way, there's ways of creating the space for it. Um, then there's pilgrimages going on sacred journeys, which are an expression of the spiritual quest in a very physical way. All of these uh, fasting during fasting periods is a kind of discipline which changes one's consciousness. All of these are built into all religions as practices. Um, And one can do all of these practices outside any particular religious framework as well. This is a characteristically modern option. It wouldn't have been possible until quite recently. So I see them all as different ways of connecting. And all of them have their value. David. Um, Yes, I find really intriguing your suggestion that materialism, or the form of materialism you were outlining is a kind of unconscious mother cult. Um, it, well, it puts me in mind of, within the Jewish tradition, a particular Kabbalistic take on uh, 
the world, a sense that God and the world were not originally two, uh, but that God or that great mysterium we call the holy or God was um, was thrown into exile from the world and our because Judaism of course is a tradition of a people in almost continual exile from their homeland um, and our work um, from this particular Kabbalistic perspective our work as 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 humans is to open uh, uh, paths for God, that mysterium, to flow back into the world. And it happens through um, people falling in love. Uh, it happens in ecstatic lovemaking. It happens very much in ecstatic dance, um, which is sort of a, uh, something that all believers must give in and let go into the dance and dance ecstatically. It also happens in laughter and states of profound joy and especially laughter. The divine cannot resist and pours back into the world that is his body. And to the extent that God inhabits the, uh, the material world ever more fully, as he flows back in, it becomes ever more apparent that he is not a he, but is she. Um, and um, as he takes on flesh and form, becomes uh, female. It's just one curious uh, Kabbalistic tale. But I was listening in your telling for, as you spoke of nature and the body, the earthly body of the world, you spoke of that here in nature too we find the Trinity. Yes. And you spoke of the um, formative principle, the field. You spoke of the dynamic or energetic principle, often sunlight. I didn't get what the what the third or the ground of being would be. Well, the ground of being is that which unifies the fields and the energy. They're not two separate. It's not a duality. They, they, the whole universe is unified. It is unified by the gravitational field which contains everything within it. And the dynamical energy principle is the light, the electromagnetic field working within the gravitational field. So those are the two fundamental universal fields, and one of them, the field of light, is always in movement. We can see distant stars and distant galaxies because the light's always traveling from them. But they're all held together in a universe by the gravi universal gravitational field into one universe. Mm. Um, and, both have, and if both didn't have a common source and weren't unified in their being. They, they, they'd be sort of contradictory principles, but they can't be. Mm. They're always working together. So the, the third of the three would be the, the two, the gravitational field and the electromagnetic light. And the ground of both, the source and of that both. that which both together. Yes. And you see, in, in modern cosmological speculation, um, the grand unified theories of the Big Bang say that the Big Bang comes into being, the whole universe is a primal unity. It's like a cosmology of the hatching of a cosmic egg, um, and all the primeval atom. But interestingly, even eggs contain the duality of the yolk and the white. So the, the, there's, right from the very beginning, there's a duality. In these modern um, theories, they say there's a primal unified field with 10 or 11 dimensions that as the universe expands, splits up to give the gravitational, the electromagnetic, and the other fields. Um, but there's also the energy that pushes it apart, which is now called dark energy. Um, without that, the primal egg would never have hatched, and the universe would not be expanding today, which it is. So, um, in modern cosmology, you, you, again, you have these, this energetic principle, which is what makes everything happen, and the unifying principle of these fields coming from a common unified field, and the whole thing having a common source. It's interesting that Lawrence Krauss, who's a, a leading atheist, and uh, wrote a book called A Universe from Nothing, where he claimed you don't need God because you can explain the universe coming from nothing. And he, he's, well, he's a Dawkins-type militant atheist. Um, I read his book recently, and um, Lawrence Krauss simply, what's interesting about it is it's so theologically conservative 
Um, he's, he, has, he says, well, there must be the universe to come into being, there must be a source of energy. Let's call that the primal quantum vacuum field, which is not empty, but which is full of all potential energy. And then you've got the laws of nature, those must exist anyway, the ordering principles of nature, as it were, the logos. And then there's a fluctuation in the, in the quantum vacuum field that uh, starts off a universe that's governed by these laws, the laws of energy. So lo and behold, you can get a universe from nothing. You don't need God. But you do need an energetic principle, <laughs> a, a, a logos principle, and uh, something that unifies them both. So what's so interesting, he sort of reinvented this whole form of theology. Yes. Hey, what do you think about Spinoza's view of God as not separate from nature? You mentioned that thing. Would you think that his view was mechanistic, or what would you say about his view? I don't think it was mechanistic. It, it was pantheistic. I mean, it's saying that God is nature, okay. nature is God. But na- God is the mind of nature, and nature is the body of God. I think it's a, a really interesting philosophy. Um, what it does is makes God totally immanent within nature and chops off the transcendent pole of God. And um, I think that it's like saying that, as I said before, that my mind is just about my body and what's happening in the world around me. But the fact is our own minds have this huge capacity for imagination and possibility of things that are not real or actual. And so his God doesn't have that transcendent dimension. Um, so it's one view, and it, it says there is God, God is conscious, nature is conscious, I agree with all that. Um, but it stops short of, of, of saying there's anything beyond nature. Um, so I think it's very good as far as it goes, it just doesn't go far enough as far as I'm concerned. Um, another one was Leibniz. You see, in the 17th century, both Spinoza and Leibniz were reacting against Descartes. And Descartes was saying, that, as I said, nature is a machine, it's mechanical, and there's a transcendent mind which is not in space and time at all, God, angels, and human minds, the spirit. And both, Descartes, both Leibniz and Spinoza were trying to get mind back into nature. Instead of what Descartes was doing was draining the mind and the soul completely out of nature, leaving it just particles of matter pushed around by forces. No life at all. Um, and Spinoza said the whole of nature is alive and is, is the mind of it is God. And Leibniz said nature has made it lots of individual organized systems, which he called monads. Each monad has a body, and each monad also has a mind. And every monad, and you're a monad, I'm a monad, you know, and, uh, Douglas fir tree of the monad, and everything reflects the universe from its own point of view. So Leibniz's version was the entire universe made of conscious centers, all over the universe, every star, every planet, all of them reflecting the whole universe from its own point of view, all different, because they're all in different places. Um, and that was another way of trying to get mind back into nature. Um, but the mechanistic science triumphed, and Spinoza and Leibniz were soon forgotten, and by the time of the Enlightenment, the end of the 18th century, everyone had gone over to a view that or most people have gone over to the view that nature is made up of atoms of matter, which is just stuff, like little billiard balls, which are pushed around by external forces in accordance with Newton's laws of motion. Um, what quantum theory shows, and why it's such a big revolution, is that there's no such thing as little bits of stuff. Atoms and molecules and electrons are vibratory patterns of activity. They're processes not things. This is the basis of Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy. Uh, a philosopher that says all nature is an organism is made up of lots of organisms. Galaxies are organisms, stars are organisms, we're organisms, plants are organisms, atoms are organisms, molecules are organisms. All of them are self-organizing systems which are processes, not things, each with their own forms, patterns, and, and internal processes of development. So I think that um, we can go... I think Spinoza was very important in putting forward a counterblast to Descartes by putting spirit back into nature. Um, 
whereas Descartes had removed it entirely, which was a very destructive thing to do because it led, first of all, to a view of God as totally transcendent, and it led, in the late 18th century, to deism, the idea of a creator God who had reason and did two things, designed the universe, started it in motion, and implanted reason in human minds so humans could understand nature through God-given reason. And that was what Benjamin Franklin and, and the, like Voltaire and, and the Enlightenment intellectuals thought, and Thomas Jefferson. But then, uh, if you've got such a remote God who never intervenes, doesn't respond to prayer, is outside the universe, then it's a short step to total atheism, and then you're left with a, a universe with no particular reason for human reason, uh, with a, a, a universe that's just moving blindly and mechanically, going nowhere, uh, which is the materialist world of human. So Spinoza attempted to stop that process by having an alternative model. And uh, I think Whitehead's model today, the process philosophy of organism, is, is, is the best of these philosophies, uh, because it um, most clearly gives a, a view of living nature. Mm. Is there, um, you, you talked about the high conscious, mm. and is there unconscious a place in the systems you. Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, we, I noticed we've reached almost our time up limit, so this will have to be the last point, um, Esther. Um, so, um, yes. At least on my own, this is now, most of what I've been talking about are not my own ideas. Um, I'm talking about a kind of synthesis of lots of other people's ideas from theology and philosophy. Um, but in, in my own ideas on morphic resonance, um, basically the idea is that through repeating something it becomes increasingly habitual, and habits become unconscious. So when I first learned to ride a bicycle, I had to learn you push a pedal down, you hold the handlebars like this and so on. Once I've learned how to ride it and done it a few times, it becomes completely habitual. So I can cycle along while I'm thinking about something completely different. My conscious mind is not preoccupied with pushing down the pedal or moving the handlebars. And so everything in nature, I think, becomes unconscious through habit. And I think most things in nature are habitual. Most species are habits. The instincts of species are habits. We're all creatures of habit. Most of what we do is habitual and unconscious. Uh, but the habits can change. And so habits, unlike so-called laws of nature, um, can evolve, they can change. Um, and evolution really is an interplay on this view between habit and creativity. Creativity usually involves consciousness, and on this view, consciousness is about the realm of possibility. It's not about the realm of habit. Consciousness is about possible, possible things that could happen and possible choices we can make. So I think if we're thinking about you know, how conscious is a plant, we'd have to look at the points of, of, of its growth which are purely habitual and the points where it may have to make decisions among possibilities. And we're the same with bees in hollyhock garden. Um, when you see bumblebees come into the garden, I mean, they're, they're collecting pollen and nectar by instinct. I mean, they haven't sat down and thought, well, it'd be a good idea to collect pollen and nectar. That's what they do by instinct. It's a habit. But when they enter the garden, there's a wide range of flowers, all different colours, shapes, and sizes. And they, they choose which ones to go to. They must make some kind of decision. And some may get into the habit of visiting one kind of flower and others other kinds of flower. And some of them seem to go for different kinds of bees. I've been looking at them recently in the garden. Bumblebees go for most flowers. Honeybees in the garden often go for estrangia, the, the estrangia growing just down the path here. Um, I've only seen honeybees on estrangia, but I've only seen bumblebees on some of the other plants. So the, the honeybees are choosing some plants. and They've all got the instinct, but there's always a freedom of choice. And so every animal has instincts which shape its basic life pattern, as we do, our instincts to eat and to drink and to have sex and, and to live in social groups are deeply embedded within us and to speak. Um, but exactly how we do that, there's always some freedom. And I think that's true of animals. And when you watch birds flying along the shore, 
where they choose to land is not the same every day or the same every time. It's influenced by what's happening. So I think there's always this freedom of choice, which is where the conscious mind comes in, always working on the basis of a whole series of unconscious habits. And I suspect that's true of the whole universe. That will have to be it, I'm afraid. <laughs>